This is Nightline, your tie line to the world, and this is Walter O'Keefe. Tonight, a visit to worlds strangely different from ours, the world of the future, the world of X minus one. Now, here is the future, X minus one. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, the Clifford D. Simak story, Drop Dead. But first, hear this. Have you ever asked yourself what this country's most important natural resource is? I'm Dorothy Olson, NBC bandstand singing school teacher. Our most important resource? Well, you might consider it our mineral deposits, or our tremendous sources of water power, or maybe our just our great forests. Well, these are all very important natural resources, but there's one resource that's more important than all these combined, our children. Don't neglect them or their educational facilities. Poor schools breed inadequate citizens for tomorrow. And another thing, keep your youngsters in tip-top shape so that they won't miss important school days. Dress them against the weather so they won't catch needless winter colds. Check their wardrobe as they go back to school this fall to be sure that they have plenty of the right kind of clothing. Remember, our children are this nation's most important natural resource. It's your job to protect their future as they go back to school this fall. Now, X minus one, and the story of an unbelievable planet. Listen to Drop Dead. Exactly one hour and 20 minutes after we sent the survey ship out on its tail, the critters showed up. Ordinarily, when you make a landing on an unknown planet, it takes at least a week for any life to come creeping out of hiding and sneak a look. But there they were, the critters. They were almost cow-sized, but not as graceful as a cow. Their bodies were put together as if every blessed one of them had run full tilt into a wall. Their hides were spliced with large squares of pastel colors, the kind of color one never finds on any self-respecting animal. Violet, pink, orange, chartreuse. The overall effect was in a checkerboard made by an old lady who did crazy quilts. Max Weber, our biologist, stood at the tail fin with me and stared. Look at that on their heads. Those, those antlers. Those are not antlers, my friend. Well, I was afraid to say it. It, it looks like vegetation. As if they were... Trying to hide behind a skimpy thicket. And what bothers me is the fruit and vegetables. That is fruit and vegetables growing on their heads. Hey, watch it. One of them's broken away from the herd and coming over this way. Step back. Give me a clear shot in case it charges. Look, here it comes. What? How do you like that? It just dropped. Dead. That animal just walked up to us and dropped dead. We left the critter lying where it fell and started to set up camp. 
Carl Parsons, our ecologist, had the stove together and the supper started before the last tent peg was driven. I dug out my diet kit and mixed up my formula, and all of them kidded me about it the way they always did. It didn't bother me. Their kidding was automatic, and I had automatic answers. I know ulcers must sound silly and archaic. You ask any medic, he'll tell you they don't happen anymore. But I have a riddled stomach and a special diet kit to prove that they sometimes do. After supper, Carl Parsons, the ecologist, Max and I, dragged the critter in and had a good look at it. Hey, look at this, Ed. This animal's got different colored blocks on it, just like a, like a checkerboard. Look at this one. Holes. Yeah. Just like one of those peg sets a kid uses toys. Here, look what I found out of that. I'll poke it with my knife. There. Looks like a bee. Well, it is. <laughs> On top of being a tomato bush and a grapevine, this critter is a walking beehive. Why couldn't they be something simple? Yeah, it never is. You know, this is a screwy place. The critters? No, not the critters. The planet itself. Never saw one like it. It's positively naked. No trees, no flowers, nothing. Almost as if someone had said, let's make a simple planet. Let's cut out all the frills. Let's skip all the biological experiments and just work on the basics. One form of life and the grass for it to eat. We unshipped the experimental animals, the rats, the zartils from Centauri, and the pumpkins from Polaris. The pumpkins made an unholy racket because pumpkins are always hungry. You just can't give them enough to eat. You turn them loose and they eat themselves to death. We got them all unshipped and set up under a shed in rows when Max walked up to me thoughtfully, chewing on a toothpick the way he always did. Ed, there's something wrong. Yeah, what do you mean? There are no insects here. I wandered around, laid down in a dozen different places. Stands to reason a man should find some insects if he looked all morning. It is natural. What about the bees? What bees? Well, the ones that were in the critter. Didn't you see any? No, I didn't get close to any critter herds. Birds? Not a one. Oh, I was wrong about the flowers. The grass is tiny flowers. Uh, but the bees to work on. Very neat, isn't it? I'm not so sure. American tradition. Now back to X-1 and the Clifford Simak story, Drop Dead. The bio team had the critters spread out on a canvas tarp. They were happily chopping them up in small pieces with a scalpel. Ed, I've got news for you. No brain. What? No brain. We can't find one and there's no nervous system. That's impossible. How can a highly organized, complex animal exist without a brain or nervous system? It's got everything else. As near as we can figure it out, there are at least a dozen different kinds of flesh. Some fish, some fowl, some good red meat, maybe even a little lizard. Well, an all-purpose animal. We found something, finally. If it's edible, and if it doesn't poison you, if it doesn't grow hair all over you... Well, that's up to you fellas. I'll get the cages down, and you can start killing off the little animals to your heart's content. And there's only one insect, these bees. And we never see these unless we're near a critter herd. And no birds, no fish in the water, not even a single cell paramecium. Yeah, I was talking it over with Max. You know, I'd give my right arm to hear a cricket or a mosquito or even a hornet. This is the strangest thing we've... Hey, Max, what are you chewing? Hmm? Hmm, toothpick. That's no toothpick. Spit it out, spit it out. Hmm? That's grass. Must have just picked it automatically to chew on it. Just a habit, I guess. Yeah. Well, go on with the report. Well, it's a walking filet mignon. That animal is an all-purpose for sure. It lays eggs, gives milk, and has six different kinds of red meat. Makes honey, two kinds of fowl, one of fish, and a whole lot of others we can't identify. 
Then, of course, the bacteria. And what about the bacteria? The critters swarm with them. And all of them the same. You know, it normally takes a hundred different kinds of bacteria to make the metabolism work. But here there's only one. It must do all the work of the hundred other species do. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the brains and the nervous system you couldn't find with your knife. The bacteria doubling in brass for both systems. The whole place balances. Nature's never static, never standing still. But here on this planet, it's standing still. Where's the competition? Where's the evolution? It's as if long ago, all these life forms said, let's quit this feuding, let's get together, let's cooperate. Symbiosis. Well, we need another critter to work on. I'll bet you we get it. Luckily, Max didn't take Carl's bet. Right after breakfast, the critter came in and died with a savoir-faire that was positively marvelous. We unloaded all our supplies and got ready for a long stay. We were feeding all the experimental animals on a critter now. The carnivorous ones ate the critter meat and the vegetarians chomped on critter fruit and critter vegetables. They all grew sleek and sassy. We were sitting around after supper one night when suddenly we heard something. Hey. What is it? Listen. Thunder. Uh-uh. Listen. I think... All right, quick. Everybody up into the ship. What is it? I heard the critters. Look, you see the dust? They're coming this way in a stampede. We swarmed up the ladder and tumbled into the port. Below us, the stampede critters went grinding through camp. There seemed to be millions of them. They came pouring past for almost an hour. When it was all done, we came down and surveyed the damage. Well, the animals are safe. They were under the tail fins. Everything else is gone. Tents carried away. Food supply is gone. How about the emergency rations in the ship? I had to move them down to the supply tent so they'd be handy. They're gone, dashed into the mud. Well, even if we lifted ship immediately, it's at least seven weeks to the nearest contact point. And no rations. Well, gentlemen, I suggest you try on your bibs. There'll be steak for dinner. Steak? That's right. Steak or fowl or fish or honey, whichever you like. You mean, eat critter? You got any other ideas? <laughs> well, for one time. Ed, I wish I had your ulcers. You've got your diet kit in your pack, right? Yeah. Well, let's get a good fire going and throw on a chunk of critter. The crew ate about a critter a day. They didn't seem to mind. Just at breakfast time, one would walk in and keel over. The crew ate like there was no tomorrow. I waited for them to break out in a rash or start turning green with purple spots or grow scales or something. But nothing happened. They felt better than they ever had. But then one morning, Max Weber turned up sick. Well, gentlemen, I've just... Taking a sample of my own blood. How do you feel? Lousy. I'm loaded with bacteria. Critter bacteria. I've checked some of the others. They've got a lower count than I have. Well, that figures. You got a head start. No. The rest of them have just been eating critter for a week. No. They remember the day you ran out of toothpicks and took to chewing on a grass stem? No. Well, we can't stop eating critter. It's all the food we have. Well, we might stop eating critter now. And as my diet kit, we might make it home. Your diet kit wouldn't last us three days. I... I took a blood sample on the test animals. They've got a bacteria count almost as high as mine. Well, it doesn't make any difference. We still have to eat critter. We haven't got any choice.
That night, Weber disappeared. We hunted him for three days. He couldn't have gone very far, but we didn't find him. We did find one queer thing, though. Hey, over here, down in the gully. Uh, what is it? That, that white fungus, kind of a ball. It wasn't here last week. We couldn't find Weber. And then about four days later, Carl woke me up. Ed, Ed, get up. Get up. What's the matter? The animals, the test animals. They're insisting. They're turning into cocoons or chrysalis or something. What? All of the test animals, the guinea pigs, the dogs, they're turning into white fungus balls. Carl, the ball we found out in the field. Weber. Max Weber. It's got to be. We had some trouble finding the place because the land was so flat and featureless. We finally located it just as dusk was setting in. It split. It looks like an egg after a chicken's been hatched. Carl? Well, what do you think? Look inside. There are two halves of that... That cocoon. Look at the marks. You can see what it is now. Ed, you're the only one who has a chance. I think you should leave right now. Get back to the center and tell them. You've got your diet kit. You can make it. No wonder there are just the critters here. Take one drink of water. Chew a single grass stem. Take one bite of critter. Do any one of those things and you turn into one of them. Listen, Ed, you take your diet kit and notes and get out of here. But I can't run out on you. Forget us. We're not human anymore. You must not stay. If you do, in a day or two, a critter will come in and drop dead for you. And you'll go crazy all the way back home, wondering which one of us it was. <laughs> I walked slowly over to the ship and I stood at the foot of the ladder holding the notes and the diet kit against my chest. I thought of all the things we'd been through together. The crew, how they'd always kidded me about the diet kit. I thought of almost ten years eating that awful goo and that I could never eat like a normal human because of my ulcerated stomach. Maybe they were the lucky ones, I told myself. If a man got turned into a critter, he'd probably come out with a whole stomach and never worry about how much or what he ate. The critters never ate anything except the grass. But maybe, I thought, that grass tasted just as good to them as steak or a pumpkin pie would taste to me. So I stood there for a while and I thought about it. Ed, what are you doing back here? Carl, I just took that diet kit... And threw it out into the waste disposal unit. What are you talking about? My friend, I am very hungry. What have you got for supper? Fred Collins speaking. And I'll have another word for you about X-1 in a moment. Hi, this is Walter O'Keefe. You know, they say there's nothing new under the sun, and maybe that's true. But there is something new under the moon, and that's Nightline. In Nightline, we think we've found the way to use the intimacy, as well as the lightning-fast maneuverability of radio, in an hour-and-a-half package of high-voltage, different entertainment. We found the way to make the airwaves your magic carpet to wherever big things are happening. Anywhere in the country, for that matter anywhere in the world. Now, let's say that your favorite comedian is performing at a Las Vegas nightclub. He's packing them in, and you've really got to have connections to get a table. Well, Nightline is that connection, and your radio is your ringside table. More things than you'd believe are happening in the so-called still of the night, and Nightline is your line to exciting entertainment after dark. 
My feeling is Nightline marks a new era in nighttime entertainment. Tune us in every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and you'll hear what I mean. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Double Indemnity by Robert Sheckley. To commit the perfect crime, all Barthold needed was centuries in which to plan it and execute it, and an insurance policy with Double Indemnity. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Drop Dead, a story written by Clifford D. Simak and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in our cast were Lawson Zerby as Ed, Ralph Camargo as Max Weber, and Joseph Bell as Carl Parsons. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by George Vutsas and is an NBC Radio Network production. You'll be on the right line to exciting entertainment when you hear Nightline tonight over most of these NBC stations. Mm-hmm.